Part 3, Expectant Attention Psychologists have noted the effect of, and realized the important part played by that mental state known as expectant attention. Expectant attention is that concentrated direction of attention toward some action, event or happening which the individual expects to occur, I. E. To which he looks forward, with more or less confidence and belief, as likely to occur or to come to pass. This mental attitude, you will note, is a form or phase of faith or confident expectation such as we have considered in the foregoing sections of this book. It is an axiom of psychology that the laws of attention operate so as to cause the individual to perceive far more clearly the objects or facts toward which his attention is specially directed and to perceive far less clearly those objects or facts which are outside of the field of his special attention. In fact, attention always proceeds by manifesting a selective action. In such selective action it more or less unconsciously, or, rather, subconsciously, brings and holds in the field of consciousness those objects which have attracted its notice and shuts out of that field those objects which have not so attracted the same. Out of the multiplicity of sights and sounds which knock at the door of consciousness at almost every moment of your life, you select those which fit in with the general subject, idea, or line of thought to which your attention is directed, and at the same time reject the consideration and perception of those not so fitting in with such. If you are especially interested in violin music, you will hear clearly the notes of the violins while the remainder of the instruments manifesting sound in the performance of a large orchestra are relegated to the fringe of consciousness and are perceived only as a general background. Another person would ignore the violins and would hear only the notes of his favorite instruments. In the same way, at a theatrical performance where a number of persons are on the stage at the same time, you are apt to see the actions and to hear the words of your favorite actor while those of the others are far less distinct in your consciousness. Likewise, you read from the pages of a book only that which is associated with your previous ideas concerning its subject, hence the old saying, we get from a book only what we give to it. The professional magician understands and employs these laws of attention. He manages to direct your attention to one of his hands, and to hold it there while his other hand performs the baldest and boldest kind of deception upon you without detection. Or, he manages to direct your attention to some other part of the stage, while under your very eyes, though unobserved by you, he makes certain changes which are necessary for the successful performance of his feat. Pickpockets and swindlers take advantage of this same state of affairs they cause us to direct our attention to some other thing or place while we leave unguarded the receptacle containing our possessions. We were all keenly awake to that to which our interested attention is directed, while we are all more or less asleep concerning the things from which such attention is diverted. This rule applies not only to your perception of objects through the senses, but also to your thoughts concerning any subject. You may imagine that you are exercising your reasoning powers judiciously, impartially and without bias. But in most cases you are considering only the facts, data and arguments which are in accord with your preconceived notions, beliefs and prejudices in the matter. You tend to see only that one particular side of the question that one set of facts that one line of argument, the opposite aspect or phase being practically ignored by you. Or, even if you are particularly careful not to fall into this error, you at least tend to overemphasize the favorite set of facts or arguments and to underemphasize the other in opposed group. Moreover, once having made up your mind concerning a subject, you fall into the habit of unconsciously or subconsciously selecting from your world of experience those facts and data which serve to corroborate your own belief, and those which serve to controvert the opposite belief. You find on all sides facts, data and arguments sustaining your position and overturning the opposite contention. You tend to become blind to undesired and unwelcome facts, data and arguments, though you may not realize this unless you are especially watchful over your mental processes. From the same experience, however, you would gather a similar array of desired evidence on the other side where you committed to the views of that side of the case. When we say you, we mean all of us as well. Our subconscious minds are strong partisans they eagerly search for and select the desired objects of thought, and determinedly shut the door to the opposite class of objects. The axiom of psychology, attention follows interest, is exemplified by common experience. We tend to perceive that in which we are especially interested, 
and to ignore that which is uninteresting. The man interested in trees perceives a world of facts while walking through a park, which facts are totally unperceived by the average man. The man interested in stone arrowheads finds them in walking through a field, though others pass them by unobserved. As John Burroughs has told us, the man with the walking a fern in mind finds walking a fern in every bit of woods, while the rest of us are not aware of its presence there. In short, all of us tend to perceive in the outside world that which corresponds with what already exists in our inner mental world. You, yourself, have often experienced the operation of this law of the mind when once you have become interested in some new subject, idea or set of facts. While up to that time you have never observed any special facts or data connected with that which has become your object of interest. Now you will have come to the conclusion that the whole world is apparently becoming aroused to an interest in that particular subject, just as you have been. You will feel this to be so because now every newspaper, magazine or book which you pick up seems to contain special references to that subject, and items of interest concerning it likewise, you will hear the subject discussed in the trains and streets at cars, in the clubs and wherever a number of persons meet and enter into conversation. On every hand you find something which fits into the subject of your new interest. But, the fact is that the change is not in the outside world it is in yourself. That which is within your mind is seeking for, and finding, that in the outside world which agrees and harmonizes with itself. Another person not so interested, or even you, yourself, were you not so interested, would be almost if not indeed totally unaware of these same interests on the part of others, even in the same places, conditions and surroundings. A new object of interest on your part acts like a pair of colored spectacles you see the outside world of things and happenings tinted in harmony with your glasses. Technically stated, your attention follows your interest and in so doing it manifests its characteristic selective power. The application of the mental laws just called to your attention is quite important in view of their practical effects upon your everyday life. By reason of these laws, the degree of your success in any particular line of work depends materially upon the degree of interest which is aroused in you concerning such work. If your interest is keen, then you will perceive and discover on all sides, in every day of your life, certain facts data and other things which will serve the purposes of that work you will find yourself dwelling in a world surrounded by such facts. If, on the contrary, you manifest little or no interest in your work, but perform the same almost mechanically, then this world of helpful things, ideas and facts will not exist for you you will dwell in another world. There will be nothing in you to call out of the outer world that which is in harmony with itself. The above he mentioned psychological laws and their effects may be stated briefly as follows. 1. You perceive only that toward which your attention is attracted and directed, and only in the degree to which that attention is so called forth. 2. Attention follows interest, and is called forth by it only in a direct ratio to the degree of that interest. Therefore you perceive only that in which you are to some degree interested, and only according to the measure of the degree of interest manifested. 3. Your world of perceptive experience is created by your interested attention, by reason of the fact that such interested attention selects from the outside world such facts as are in agreement with its inner states, and rejects those facts which are opposed to such. 4. The same state of affairs is manifested in your mental world of memory, recollection, and selection of ideas you select and perceive those which accord with your interest, and reject the opposite class. Now, the above brings us back to our consideration of the subject of expectant attention, which, as we have said, is a phase of faith or confident expectation. Expectant attention is a very potent and active form of interested attention. In it you not only are interested in an object, subject or state of affairs, but, in addition, you believe in certain conditions or facts and expect that certain results will occur by reason of their presence. You not only have your attention directed toward the thing by reason of your interest in it, and see that which is in accordance with this, but you also expect, I, e, confidently believe, that certain events will happen or come to pass concerning those things, or proceeding from them. The cat watching at a mouse hole, or the dog digging out a woodchuck, manifests the keenest and most active kind of attention imaginable. This not only because the animal is intensely interested in the object of obtaining his prey, 
but also because he hopes to capture it, expects to secure it because he believes that he will get it in the end. If the animal did not so keenly believe and expect the successful result, his interest and attention would lack that intensity which is now present and his energies would not be so actively called forth and manifested. This rule is equally true of human endeavor. When you believe in the probability of a successful outcome of an undertaking, you experience the keenest interest in the work leading to it. Your work is in direct relation to that expectation. If, on the contrary, you entertain grave doubts of the efficacy of your efforts and work, your energies will slacken your interest will abate, and your attention will relax and, as a consequence, your work will become less effective. Again, if you not only doubt and question the successful outcome, but also go so far as to actually believe that the effort will result in failure, then your interest will become dead, your attention weak, and your work of the poorest and most ineffective quality. More than this, if your belief, and expectant attention be that of the certainty of failure, then you will actually find yourself unconsciously working with that idea in mind, and toward that end you will be deliberately, though subconsciously, riding to a fall. What has been said above concerning the effect of interest, attention and expectancy, upon the conscious activities of your mind, is trebly true concerning your subconscious activities. The subconscious mind is peculiarly liable to be affected by beliefs of the kind noted to suggestions in accordance with these coming from your conscious mentality. It accepts as true your beliefs and convictions, your confident expectations, your earnest hopes concerning the probable result of courses of action or existing causes and it proceeds to manifest its powers in the direction so pointed out to it. Accordingly, it blinds the attention to facts, ideas and conditions running contrary to your beliefs and expectations and it renders keen your powers of perception of those facts, ideas, and conditions which agree with your beliefs and expectations. The subconscious mentality is very active at works even while you sleep, and while you are thinking of other things and, though in the first place it is influenced greatly by your conscious thoughts and beliefs, it eventually acquires control over the latter to a marked degree. Inasmuch as over 75% of your mental operations are performed on the superconscious planes of mentation, you will see that this subconscious mentality is capable of influencing your mental attitude, and your mental direction of effort, to a very considerable extent. Accordingly, you will realize how important it is to have your beliefs and expectant attention under control and to have them working in the right direction. Let us give you a few illustrations of the above he has stated principle, drawn from the experiences of everyday life experiences on the physical plane, but in which the subconscious mental influence is manifest. These illustrations may be deemed trivial by those who fail to perceive that the principle operating in them is also involved in far more important happenings and action. We ask you to accept these as simple illustrations of a far from simple general class of phenomena. Several of years ago, one of the writers of this book knew a young man who was an expert bowler. He was a very careful player, with mind and muscles well under control, with great powers of concentration on his play, and with nerves not easily rattled. When questioned carefully by the writer concerning the mental operations leading to his careful play, he gave some very interesting and instructive answers. Among other things, he said that he attributed his successful play largely to his gradually acquired habit of arousing a mental state of certainty, assurance, and confident expectation that his aim would be perfect. He said that sometimes it was rather difficult to arouse that feeling as he expressed it, it is sometimes slow at coming, but that he would wait a few moments until it came. This coming, as he called it, was manifested by a certain sort of a click in my mind, which was the signal to send the ball forward. When that click came, he just knew for certain that his aim was perfect. The confident expectation, or expectant attention, served so to coordinate his mental calculation and his muscular effort that success was assured. He told the writer that early in his bowling experience he was subject to being rattled by the remarks and chaffing of opposing players, and, so, often failed to make a strike which ordinarily was quite easy. He said that he managed to overcome this difficulty by cultivating the power of shutting out from his consciousness the remarks of others. He added, however, that even quite late in his experience he lost a game by reason of having accepted the adverse suggestion of a bystander. As nearly as the writer can recollect the conversation, 
he used the following words in describing this occurrence, I was at a close stage of the game, and I could win only by putting the ball between the one and two pins, which ought to have been easy for me to do, judging from my past record. Just as I was about to bowl, a friend of my opponent said, quietly, as if to his friend, A just watch him hit the four pin. Somehow, or some way, there crept into my mind expectant attention the idea that I was going to hit the four pin, which was about the worst thing I could do just then. I can't say that I was exactly afraid but I got the notion that I was going to hit that four pin in spite of myself I actually believed and expected it. I aimed with my usual care, straight between the one and two pins, and then let the ball go. I never could tell how it happened, but my ball rolled right toward that four pin, and struck it fair and square. And so, instead of making a ten strike I got only a split. That fellow sure hooted me, all right. I never knew how he did it but do it he did. Here was evidently a case of misdirected expectant attention faith reversed. He believed and expected the bad shot, and, although he used his habitual care, his subconscious mind manifested his belief and unconsciously to him influenced his muscular action at the critical moment. His click of certainty in ordinary cases was the result of the same psychological principle. In either case, in each case, the subconscious mentality was striving to make true in outer action the inner belief. It was a case of thought taking form in action, of the response of the physical muscles to the subconscious mental state. We understand that baseball players report a similar state of affairs. They often just know the probable result of their batting, or of their catching of the ball in the field. They experience that certain state of expectant attention which is a phase of confident expectation and their muscles become a perfectly coordinated machine. Again, when a player allows himself to be rattled by the shouts from the benches when he allows the adverse suggestions to obtain lodgment in his subconscious mind then the faith is reversed, and that which he fears comes upon him. In either case there is manifested in action the mental picture formed in the mind of the player. The ideal tends to become real expectant attention creates the ideal and the subconscious mentality performs the action. The writer was once told by an exam manager of noted pugilists that a similar condition is found to exist among prize fighters. He said, if a boy believes that he is going to be licked, then licked he is in advance of the match. If, on the contrary, he feels in his heart that he is the better man, then his chances of success are enormously increased. There's a whole lot of this Minda stuff in ring fighting, believe me. The writer personally met with a similar case, occurring 20 years ago in the days of bicycles and cable cars. He was riding on the grip car, on the front part of the bench of the open car then used. Hearing the gripman using strong language, he looked ahead, and there saw a young colored man riding a bicycle and trying to cross the street on an angle, just in front of the car. Ordinarily there would have been no difficulty in his making the crossing there was plenty of room and plenty of time for it. But when the gripman swore at him, and called out look out, there, you're going to run into the car, the young man's hand seemed to turn in spite of himself, and he, seemingly deliberately, turned his wheel and ran straight into the car. When picked out of the wreck of his bicycle, badly shaken up but uninjured, he was asked why he turned his wheel toward the car. He answered, I don't know, I don't know I expect dad will just got scared and run away with me. The real truth was that his expectant attention was active, and the wheel acted just as he looked for it to act his subconscious mentality performing the action. Many older time bicycle riders will understand and appreciate this illustration they have been there themselves. The same principle may be seen in operation in the actions of children. Children are very apt to take on the suggestions of their elders and to act upon them subconsciously even when they don't want to. We have witnessed the unfortunate result of the admonition, look out, Myrtle, you'll drop that vase look out, it's slipping now. Of course, bang went the vase. Again, look out, Johnny, be careful you'll slip off the banister. Johnny accepts the suggestion, his subconscious mentality believes it, and the action follows. We once saw a little boy walking along the top of a high brick wall he made the trip backward and forward several times without trouble. But when, finally, a grown-up shouted a warning of danger, coupled with the assertion that the boy would fall off, the boy's expectant attention was aroused, and down he came. A leading tightrope performer has stated in a newspaper interview that if he entertains the thought that he will fall, he is almost certain to become wobbly 
and then needs to exert considerable willpower to maintain his balance. The above recited illustrations of the effect of confident expectation, in its phase of expectant attention, in these little simple matters of everyday experience, are likewise illustrations of the operation of the same psychological principle the principle of faith in its many forms in many far more important, and far more complex, matters of life and action. As we proceed in our consideration of the subject in this instruction, you will perceive the same universal principle at work along many different lines, and in many different forms, phases and aspects of its power. For the present, we ask you merely to bear in mind this statement, the entire set of mental processes, conscious, subconscious, and unconscious, tend to proceed in the direction of expectant attention, or confident expectation which is a phase of faith. The mind, consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously, strives to build around itself a world corresponding to its beliefs, and to act along the lines of its beliefs, even when such a world or such actions are not desired. Hope and fear, when expressions of confident expectation, or expectant attention, are potent motive powers, particularly along subconscious lines of mentation.